Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and you can think of me as your friendly guide to the English language, writing, history, rules, and cool stuff. Today, I have a meaty middle about mondegreens and other ways we misunderstand words, another meaty middle about the ampersand, and a familect story about distracted driving. But first, support for today's show comes from Magoosh. Do you need to take a standardized test like the GRE, GMAT, LSAT, MCAT, or SAT? Magoosh Online Test Prep will give you the tools you need to get a great score, like study schedules, up-to-date practice sessions, video lessons, and support from expert tutors. Study anywhere, anytime, on desktop or mobile. Visit Magoosh, M-A-G-O-O-S-H dot com and enter the promo code GRAMMAR for a 15% discount. This is one of a few questions I got about mondegreens after I mentioned them in the episode last month about the poop emoji. Hi, Mignon. This is JT Morris from Evergreen, Texas. I'm a huge fan of Grammar Girl. And I just listened to the episode today in which you had a segment about an egg corn related to a poop emoji. (laughs) That was the word holy and the proper spelling of that in relation to that text. In listening to that segment, I realized I think I have been misusing the word mondegreen. I always assumed that what you referred to as an egg corn was a mondegreen. So I would love some feedback on the differentiation between an egg corn and a montegreen for clarification purposes. <laughs> Thanks so much. And uh, yeah, I totally love the podcast. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for the question, JT. There are so many different kinds of errors that sometimes it seems overwhelming, but fortunately, a lot of them are funny, like thinking Credence Clearwater Revival saying, there's a bathroom on the right, instead of there's a bad moon on the rise, and saying something is a little fit bunny instead of a little bit funny. I'll start with egg corns and then explain how they're different from mondegreens, and then we'll also talk about spoonerisms and malapropisms because they're similar too. Mondegreens happen when you mishear something, usually a song lyric, and create a new meaning. The credence, there's a bathroom on the right mistake, is a mondegreen, as it is when people listen to Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and hear Olive, the other reindeer, used to laugh and call him names, instead of all of the other reindeer. The name Mondegreen was coined by a writer named Sylvia Wright, who misheard a line from a 17th century Scottish ballad. Ye highlands and ye lowlands, oh, where hae ye been? They hae slain the Earl O'More and laid him on the green. Unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately for the future of wordplay, Wright heard the last line as, and Lady Mondegreen, instead of, and laid him on the green. Wright had imagined a second slaying victim where there was none, and when she discovered the error, she decided to name the phenomenon after the non-existent Lady Mondegreen. Some of my favorite Mondegreens come from children's misinterpretations of the Pledge of Allegiance. I'm thinking of the scene in the movie Kindergarten Cop, where the kids are saying the pledge, and if I remember correctly, there are lines like, I led the pigeons to the flag, and one nation under God, invisible, with liberty and justice for all. There are a lot of great Mondegreens from popular music, too. For example, some people think the song from The Killers is Mr. Nice Guy instead of Mr. Brightside, and some people hear the TLC lyric Don't Go Chasing Waterfalls as Don't Go, Jason Waterfalls. That Jason, he just won't stay. A reader named Mark said that in Billy Joel's song We Didn't Start the Fire, many people hear Trouble in the Suez as Trouble in the Sewers. And a reader named Jennifer said that when she was a kid, she used to go around the house singing sand on the rug instead of band on the run. If you like Mondegreens, Gavin Edwards has written a series of books about them, including Excuse Me While I Kiss This Guy, When a Man Loves a Walnut, and He's Got the Whole World in His Pants. (laughs) I like to imagine the mythical Lady Mondegreen happily singing along. 
Egg corns were first identified as a separate phenomenon in 2003 and got their name from a discussion on the Language Log website about a woman who misheard the word acorn as egg corn. In egg corns, people replace the right word with a different word that sounds the same, a homophone, that makes logical sense in the phrase. For example, as I said last month, the woman who made up the word egg corn to mistakenly describe an acorn could have been imagining that an egg could grow into a chicken like the oak nut grows into a tree, and that makes some kind of logical sense. In another example, a reader named Stephanie said she always thought people were saying windshield factor and didn't realize it was wind chill factor until she was in her 20s. It made sense to her because she thought when you're in a car, it's warmer, but the windshield factor would take into account the elements if you were outside the car. And you can see how this might make sense. So that's an egg corn, too. It doesn't change the meaning like in a mondegreen. Windshield factor and wind chill factor have the same meaning in Stephanie's mind. But in a mondegreen, like when you think the line is trouble in the sewers instead of trouble in the Suez, the new wrong form means something different from the right form. Other examples of egg corns include coming down the pipe instead of coming down the pike and chomping at the bit instead of champing at the bit. Many of the most common egg corns seem to swap homophones in familiar phrases, such as writing here here using H E R E instead of H E A R. It's spelled here like in the way you hear with your ears because it means something like hear him, hear him. Another one is B A I L I N G for B A L I N G in bailing wire, and T O W instead of T O E in toe the line. It's spelled toe like the things on your feet because it comes from the idea of people putting their toes on a line on the ground. So egg corns and mondegreens both happen when you mishear something, and the main difference is that mondegreens dramatically change the meaning of the phrase, and egg corns don't. Next, I'll talk about malapropisms. The name comes from a French phrase meaning badly for the purpose. People started using it to describe the silly misuse of words after the playwright Richard Sheridan named one of his characters, who had a habit of ridiculously mixing up words, Mrs. Malaprop. Malapropisms occur when someone substitutes a similar-sounding word for another word. For example, George Bush was reported to say nuclear power pants instead of nuclear power plants in 2003. And in Sheridan's play, Mrs. Malaprop says someone is the very pineapple of politeness instead of the very pinnacle of politeness. Scott Perez Fox reminded me that Dogberry in Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing makes great comic use of malapropisms. For example, he says, O oh, villain, thou wilt be condemned into everlasting redemption for this, when he meant everlasting damnation. The difference between a malapropism and a mondegreen can be subtle, but people typically think of a malapropism as a mistake made by a speaker, someone like Mrs. Malaprop saying the wrong word, whereas a mondegreen is a mistake made by a listener, someone mishearing a word or phrase. Also, people sometimes intentionally use malapropisms to be funny, but mondegreens are innocent mistakes. Now, back to the little fit bunny type of error I mentioned at the beginning. It's called a spoonerism, in honor of Reverend William Archibald Spooner, who taught at New College in Oxford in the 1800s and early 1900s, and had a reputation for mixing up words. Reports say that he was less than thrilled to be quote-unquote honored by having the error named after him. A spoonerism is another particular kind of mix-up. It happens when you swap sounds between two words in a phrase. There are unintentional spoonerisms that don't make sense, such as goys and burls for boys and girls. And then there are spoonerisms that create new funny meanings, such as keys and parrots for peas and carrots, and better nate than lever for better late than never. I confess that on more than one occasion I have called my relatives Gail and Dave, Dale and Gave. 
There are also intentional Spoonerisms. For example, Keen James wrote a book called Stupin Gale's Tale is Twisted, Spoonerisms Run Amok, that retells fairy tales using Spoonerisms. Chapters include Beeping Sluty and Prinderella and the Synths. Christopher Manson wrote a book called The Rails I Tote, which has 45 Spoonerism cartoons for readers to decipher, such as bee tags for tea bags. And Shel Silverson authored a book called Runny Babbitt, a Billy Sook, which obviously uses Spoonerisms. When I covered this topic a few years ago, a reader named Danielle told me about a story called Rindersella instead of Cinderella. She said her favorite part is the last line, which goes like this. Now, the storrel of the Mori is this. If you ever go to a bancy fall and you want a pransom hints to loll in fove with you, don't forget to slop your dripper. <laughs> the original Rindersella skit appeared on the TV show Hee Haw, and you can watch the video on YouTube. As I was researching this topic, I also came across spoonerisms that seemed to be intentional attempts to eliminate swear words while still getting the point across. Some of the less offensive examples include Nucking Futs from the movie Dickie Roberts, former child star, Biserable Mastered from the video game Escape from Monkey Island, Bass Ackwards, and No Wucking Furries. It makes me wonder if Reverend Spooner is growling over in his rave. Spoonerisms, Mondegreens, Eggcorns, and Malapropisms are all instances where you get the words wrong. My brain is starting to hurt trying to keep the names straight, so I'll summarize them again. Spoonerisms are what you get when a speaker mixes up sounds, making phrases such as better nate than lever. Remember William Spooner and his particular kind of mix-up, such as the Lord is a shoving leopard instead of the Lord is a loving shepherd. Mondegreens are what you get when listeners mishear words. For example, when people think the song lyrics are sweet dreams are made of cheese instead of sweet dreams are made of this. Think of Lady Mondegreen being laid on the green. Eggcorns are what you get when people swap homophones in phrases, such as spelling hear, hear, H-E-R-E instead of H-E-A-R. Remember the woman who thought an acorn was an egg corn. And malapropisms are what you get when someone substitutes a similar sounding word for another, such as he's the pineapple of politeness instead of he's the pinnacle of politeness. Remember funny Mrs. Malaprop from the Richard Sheridan play. Before we get to ampersands, thanks to our sponsor Blinkist. No matter how much you love to read, it can be hard to find time to do it, but Blinkist can change that. Blinkist is the only app that condenses thousands of nonfiction books into just the key takeaways and need-to-know information, so you can read or listen in just 15 minutes. That way, busy people like you and me can get the main points quickly without reading the entire book. 10 million people are using Blinkist right now, and its huge library is constantly growing, including self-help, business, health, and history. I like Blinkist because I can fit in listening to a Blink when I wouldn't be able to read a whole book. For example, I'm taking a free, non-graded online course, and I was supposed to read a biography of someone who changed the world this week, but I'm super busy and didn't have time for a whole book. So to at least kind of keep up with the class, I listened to a blink of Harriet Tubman's biography, The Road to Freedom. And Blinkist has lots of great books you've always wanted to read. For example, I've also listened to the blinks of The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg and Start With Why by Simon Sinek. And right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer for Grammar Girl listeners. Go to Blinkist.com slash grammar to start your free seven-day trial. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash grammar to start your free seven-day trial. Blinkist.com slash grammar. Today's episode is also supported by Bombus Socks, the coolest thing to have in school. Bombus are the most comfortable kids' socks ever. They are innovated with comfort in mind, so even kids who hate wearing socks will feel at home in their Bombus. And they're super colorful, bursting with color. They even have a colorful bee on them. 
Bombas also makes socks in adult sizes, and for every pair you buy, they donate a pair to someone in need. So grab a pair for yourself, too. My husband knows how much I love their socks, so it was really cute. When I got an envelope of Bombas socks in the mail last week, he came in waving it in the air, yelling, socks, socks, like a town crier. <laughs> and that envelope had a new style in them that I hadn't tried before and really like, runner socks. I'm not a runner, but they're the perfect height. Not too high, not too low. So send your kids back to school with Bombas, the socks that will keep them comfy, colorful, and ready to take on the school year. Visit bombas.com slash grammar and get 20% off your first purchase. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash grammar for 20% off. Bombas.com slash grammar. In the recent episode about vacation words, we said that you write the abbreviation for rest and relaxation with an ampersand, r and And I thought some of you might want more information about the ampersand because it's kind of an odd little symbol that actually used to be part of the alphabet. And it also turns out that its name is something of a mondegreen, which as we just learned is a word based on a misunderstanding or mishearing. Nobody knows who invented the ampersand, according to Keith Houston, who writes the Shady Characters website about punctuation and symbols, and has published a book by the same name. But the earliest known use of an ampersand is in graffiti on a wall in Pompeii. The Latin word for and is et, E-T, and the ampersand symbol was originally formed as a blend of those two letters, E and T. Today, when letters are connected like this in typefaces, we call them ligatures. When I think of ligatures, I always think of the A and E you sometimes see connected in words like encyclopedia. I can't recommend the Shady Characters website to you enough if you're interested in more history on the ampersand, or really any punctuation mark or symbol. Here's one delightful line from Keith's pages on the ampersand. He wrote, Similarly, the italic ampersand has become something of a playground for typographers, and many italic ampersands are intricately designed works of art when compared to their conformist Roman counterparts. And it's true. Play around with typing ampersands in different fonts and then changing the text to italics to see the huge variety in how it's styled. So how is the name ampersand a mondegreen? Well, first you need to know that the ampersand used to be the last quote-unquote letter of the alphabet. Children would recite the end of the alphabet as X, Y, Z, and per se and, with that last and being the ampersand symbol. Per se is Latin for by itself, so they were essentially saying X, Y, Z, and by itself and. And as an aside, back in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, they used a completely different rhyme from what kids today used to learn the alphabet, called apple pie ABC. There were lots of versions of it, but they all related to a story about the letters eating apple pie. B bit it, C cut it, and so on. The ABC song we know today, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, that wasn't copyrighted until 1835. Anyway, back to the ampersand. Much like the way people mishear the line in the Star-Spangled Banner, Oh, say, can you see, as Jose, can you see, a mishearing we call a mondegreen, school children forced to recite Latin at the end of their ABCs, X, Y, Z, and per se, and, heard a lot of different things for that and per se, and part, including amper Z, and also something that seemed like a name, Anne Passy Anne, just as Sylvia Wright heard the name Lady Mondegreen, for it laid him on the green. The Oxford English Dictionary actually lists three of the other mishearings as early forms of the word. Am Passy and, Am Pussy and, and Am Puss and. Before that, I believe it was simply just called and, and the simple wasn't distinguished from the word by having its own name. Eventually, sometime in the late 1800s, English seemed to settle on the name ampersand. At the time, the ampersand wasn't the only letter that got the per se treatment, either. According to Merriam-Webster, people would also use the phrase to identify single letters that were being used as words instead of letters. 
For example, people would say I per se I to show they meant the word I instead of the letter I. And a note from an 1871 publication called Notes and Queries says the letter A was often referred to as A per se. And then that phrase came to mean first rate or excellent because of A's position at the beginning of the alphabet. It gives the example of describing a woman as she was a woman A per se alone. Let's finish with how to actually use an ampersand. You don't use it every time you want to represent the word and. Although ampersands are thought of as informal, if the ampersand is officially part of a company name, it's best to use the ampersand instead of writing out the word and. For example, you write Tiffany and Company, Procter and Gamble, and AT&T with ampersands. In general, you write the company's name the way it wants it written. However, the New York Times Manual of Style and Usage does say to use the ampersand to replace less common abbreviations for and in company names. For example, the creative agency Wyden and Kennedy writes its name with a plus sign for the and, but the New York Times Style Guide says to replace it with an ampersand. You also use ampersands with certain abbreviations that everyone seems to agree take an ampersand, such as R&R for rest and relaxation, B&B for bed and breakfast, R&B for rhythm and blues, Q&A for questions and answers, and R&D for research and development. If you aren't sure whether an abbreviation takes an ampersand, you can usually look it up. In company names with words, like Tiffany and Company, you put a space on both sides of the ampersand, as if it were a word. But in abbreviations, you don't put a space, whether it's a company name like AT&T or an abbreviation like R&R. What about commas and ampersands? Well, the Chicago Manual of Style says that although you use serial commas in Chicago style, you don't use a serial comma in a company name if the and is written as an ampersand instead of as the word and. In case you don't remember, the serial comma is the comma before the final and in a series, the comma before and in red, comma, white, comma, and blue. So for company names in Chicago style, you'd write Smith, comma, Jones, comma, and Williams if the word and is written out, but Smith, comma, Jones, and Williams, no comma, if the and is written as an ampersand. Finally, here's a cool tidbit about the role the ampersand plays in the screenwriting world. According to the Writers Guild, if two writers are listed in the credits and their names are connected by an ampersand, it means they wrote the script as a team. But if two writers are listed and their names are connected by the word and, it means they worked on the script separately. Who knew there could be so much meaning packed into one little and or ampersand? Finally, I have a familect story about driving and missing your turn. Hi, Grammar Girl. This is Tom from Louisville, Kentucky. I have a familect phrase for you. My family uses the phrase, going to Wisconsin. Years ago, my wife and her mother were on a road trip driving across Illinois headed for Chicago. They were having a wonderful time engaging in nearly constant conversation as they traveled. Suddenly, one of them interrupted the other and said with some alarm in her voice, did that sign we just passed say welcome to Wisconsin? As it turned out, they were so involved in their conversation that they managed to drive right by Chicago and end up in Wisconsin. So now whenever someone in the family is driving and misses their exit or gets lost because they were distracted by something else, or for other instances when we do something silly because we were distracted, we might say that person was going to Wisconsin. Thanks for all your work on the podcast, Grammar Girl. Bye. Thanks, Tom. I can relate to your story because something like that happened to me on my way to Las Vegas, and I ended up in the middle of the desert, desperately hoping I didn't run out of gas. If you want to hear your family story on the show, the story of a word your family and only your family uses, leave a voicemail message at 83 321 girl And be sure to tell me the story, because that's always the best part. I'm Mignon Fogarty, grammar girl and author of the New York Times bestseller, Grammar Girl's Quick and Dirty Tips for Better Writing. And my audio producer is Nathan Sems. This show is part of the Quick and Dirty Tips podcast network, and we have a new host for the Savvy Psychologist podcast. 
Dr. Jade Wu is a clinical psychologist who sees patients and focuses her research on the role of sleep in chronic conditions. And her first show is How Much Sleep Do You Really Need? It's a great question, and it's more complicated than I thought. Check it out wherever you get your podcasts. That's The Savvy Psychologist. That's all. Thanks for listening. 